This session we have focused deliberately on the maritime sector, but DGI is very traditionally a, a sort of land focused event shall we say, so this year we've looked at trying to introduce some of the maritime uh, issues that, uh, that, that, that people have. Uh, we've put together an excellent panel, uh, the way I look at it we have representatives from, from at a very high senior government level who have run major organisations with uh, Admiral Moret who used to be in charge of, of NGA. We have uh, Martin Jones uh, from the UK uh, MOD who is looking at the intelligence collection strategy and policy. So he is looking to the future as to what, uh, what the, his customers need in terms of geospatial intelligence from the maritime perspective. We have Lieutenant Commander Susan Long Poucher from the NATO Shipping Centre here in Northwood. Uh, and now Susan is a user of the data. So every day she's using GeoInt as part of her job at the NATO Shipping Centre. Uh, we have Marcello Maranese uh, from EGOS in Italy, uh, who are responsible for the Cosmo SkyMed uh, SAR imagery satellites and providing that as a service. And uh, you probably heard Marcello this morning giving his presentation. Uh, and my name's John Allen. I I'm Vice President uh, of Exact Earth, and, and we provide a satellite AIS-based service. So between the five of us, I think we cover all the, all the key issues that, that are facing the, the, the maritime sector at the moment, and I, I'm looking forward to a really good discussion. The, the goal is that we'll have a five to six minute presentation by the other four panel members uh, after a short introduction, uh, and then it's to open the floor to everybody to ask questions. And so we're planning about half an hour of presentations, half an hour of discussion. So please, you know, let, let's ask those questions and let's have a good and open and honest uh, discussion. So, you know, why are we concerned about this? Well, obviously, we're, we're well aware of the issues out there on, on the maritime domain at the moment, having you know, read the newspapers. But when you start looking at it, you know, the, the oceans represent 70% of the Earth's surface. You know, they're, they're what in, in, in today's technology are called unwired regions. There is no other way of communicating from those regions other than by satellite. And if you don't want to communicate, you can disappear in a black hole. So. You know, we have to find ways of monitoring and, surveillance and, and, and providing surveillance over those black holes and the satellite side of things, uh, the imagery, the satellite AIS is, is one of the first steps towards that. So it's a key hole in terms of, 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 of the overall intelligence picture and that's what we're, we're trying to, to solve in general. I particularly like this slide. I, I have to admit I stole it from the DHS, uh, the Department of Homeland Security presentation I was at a year ago about maritime domain awareness, because it's, it's, it's an oft-used phrase, and, and you ask different people what it means, and you get so many different answers. I particularly like this, because it explains why it's important. It's the maritime domain awareness is understanding the normal conditions, because only by understanding the normal conditions can you spot the trends. You know the trends, anomalies tend to stick out a little bit better. Once you know the anomaly, you can then target your other assets, maritime patrol aircraft, surface vehicles, etc., to go and, and, and find out what's happening. So understanding what's happening out there is not just focused on one incident, it's a continuum. You have to understand globally what is happening to understand some of the issues that are affecting the smaller regions. So that, that to me, is, 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 is the key definition. It's a continual process and a global effort. We have to look at the whole thing from a, a global perspective. A lot of you are familiar with the AIS sites on the web, and obviously you have access to, to your own data, but you know, the, when you look at the AIS sites on the web that, that provide data, that, that's the coverage. You know, the black holes I was talking about, we can fill those in from satellite. So this is what satellite AIS can do. We'll talk later about you know, how that integrates with some of the other applications. So again, the truly global view. Uh, down to a specific ship. Now you'll recognize this one from the news. I, I think this is actually coastal. I can't make claim to this because the, uh, the captain obviously went very close to the coast on that one as well. And if you look at this, he's obviously got wheels on the boat for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Surprised they didn't check for scratches on the hull before they let him out again. But uh, again, just using AIS, not just from a real time perspective, but for analytical purposes. In New Zealand, they're analyzing the RENA, the ship that ran aground there. They're tracking you know, everywhere he went to see if there's any indication. So there's, there's a huge raft of information out there that, that can be provided by, by things like this. 
And then radar imagery, you know, Marcello will talk a little bit about radar imagery. Uh, again, widely used in the maritime domain. Uh, it, can, it can look, obviously, you know, through cloud, it can, it can find things that, it gives you information about something on the surface. You know, that, that's what it gives you. So together with other information, it lets you identify those vessels. So these are vessels, say, from the radar image, what you can then do with combining it with AAS is suddenly get that extra information, the course, the speed, the direction, all those sort of things. So the message here is it's not just about one data source, it's about many. You know, one data source won't do it. Combining and integrating and fusing, as we've heard from most of the speakers, is important. And I hope that's the message that will come out from the, uh, the panel discussions today. Okay, that, that is my very, very quick introduction. So on that basis, I, I, I suggested to the panel that they sit down here so they can watch the presentations. Then when the panel starts, we'll, we'll get them all up here to answer the questions. But uh, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, I've asked them to give a little bio. I, I hate reading out these long lists of, of what people have done. So I'm going to let them explain who they are and why they're up here and then talk a little bit about what their views are on the, on the whole uh, issue of maritime geoint. So Anne Mumret, please. Good afternoon, and I'm glad we have a <clears throat> good introduction from John here uh, today. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Moret. I'm currently at Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York, which is, let's see, for our panel, it's close to Canada. It used to be part of the UK a long time ago. Um, let's see, Little Italy in Syracuse has the best Italian food outside of Italy. And I think I've got everything covered there for now, so that should take care of the countries we're looking at today. Uh, before my previous assignment was uh, at NGA as part of the uh, great leadership team that was there and continues to the present day. Uh, before that, of interest to this audience, I was the Director of Naval Intelligence in the United States. Before that, I was a Vice J2 on the Joint Staff for several years, then a <coughs> series of other assignments in the Navy going back to the, uh, the mid-1970s. I just have two slides this afternoon that I wanted to use as a kickoff, really, for the panel discussion. The first one has to do with uh, international maritime demand, similar to what John has already touched on, and then I have a second slide that talks about some of the responses that are perhaps most important as we deal with the things that we're being looked to uh, for today. And the first is the uh, increased emphasis that we have all seen on the, the global commons, uh, which are more and more a part of the security concerns that we have around the world today. Uh, I'm sorry to say that of the three global commons, the high seas are probably the ones that get the least attention. Uh, we could probably poll the audience, but I mean, how much commotion have you seen in the last couple of years about the cyber domain and resources dedicated to it and so forth? I mean, it really has probably eclipsed the other two, although space continues to get a lot, lot of attention. And to some degree, it's useful to reiterate the importance of the high seas the maritime domain and its importance relative to the other global commons which are getting so much of a focus around the, uh, the world today. Second point, changes in worldwide maritime security missions. John has already touched on some of them, but the continued emphasis that we are likely to have in the future on exclusion zones, um, uh, proliferation, anti-piracy operations, and uh, just basic naval warfare, which is something that we cannot uh, forget to uh, emphasize the competences of, and which can become very, very important overnight. And probably the best example for that that I will provide is one that is a trophy greatly over the past 20 years that needs renewed emphasis is anti-submarine warfare, which is a core military competence that we cannot let diminish because uh, you never know when you're going to need it, and it can happen absolutely overnight, particularly because of the range of forces that we've all seen develop in many different parts uh, around the world. The constant demand for both civil maritime and the navies. I put both of them up there in that order with some forethought. But the uh, demands that we have for safety of civil maritime missions and the way that navies support that commerce around the world. And the um, operational support that you need, intelligence and otherwise, to have a common operational picture that applies not just to uh, navies and military forces uh, around the oceans of the world, but also for civil maritime support, as we have seen in so many places, to include the, uh, the Horn of Africa. Proliferation and ungoverned and semi-governed water space, those are two separate things, but they're, I think, both very important. Um, 
proliferators who are doing things that they should not be doing have essentially two choices. They can either proliferate over the oceans or they can lease very expensive dodgy aircraft to carry weapons and technologies from one country to another country. And most of the, the bad actors around the world that do that tend to be far away from each other, so they shy away from the, uh, the airborne dimension. Uh, stopping proliferation on the high seas will continue to be a vital mission. And uh, we have to be very careful over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years to make sure that things, technologies related specifically to WMD and delivery vehicles don't get to the places where they shouldn't be. And a lot of that's going to take place in the high seas. We're going to need to be ready for it. The other aspect is ungoverned and semi-governed water space. We talk all the time about ungoverned and semi-governed countries, places like Somalia, uh, parts of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, other parts of the world. Um, we also have some ungoverned and semi-governed water space. And we ought to have as much discussion about parts of the world's oceans that are ungoverned as we do about parts of uh, the Earth that are uh, uh, causing us problems in some of the areas that I, uh, I mentioned earlier. And that uh, I'm glad to say is getting more discussion than it used to. Another point, the importance of maritime partnerships and regional approaches uh, that we see represented around the room here today. I already stressed uh, <clears throat> today the importance of the, uh, the NATO alliance, which maintains some uh, credible maritime competence, I'm happy to say, and continued emphasis in that area. But the integrated maritime analysis, it will be important to keep that together. And uh, as part of that, as I'll discuss uh, as I go on, GEOIN should be the baseline for operation intelligent, operational intelligence. And we need to remind ourselves that it has to do with things that happen below the oceans, on the oceans, and above the oceans in all three domains. Okay, final slide, overarching trends that we've seen in maritime geospatial <coughs> intelligence. Uh, something that uh, was also touched on earlier, but the uh, balancing act that we have to have as part of the team while at the same time maintaining uh, the focus that we need to have for our subject matter expertise, as I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, the integration of the maritime picture, the COP, if you want to call it, or the RMP. This is, it is referred to in some quarters, a recognized maritime picture, and being part of the team that brings in signals intelligence, and as uh, John was just referring to, a whole wide variety of sensors that we can use. Visualization for commanders so they can see as well as possible what is happening in a time-sensitive tactical situation because timeliness is uh, probably the most important factor here, particularly as you get into um, any kind of uh, tactical challenge in the maritime domain. And the analysis that you need to have, which underlies it, and the focus that we all need to have on analysis. Uh, advancing uh, maritime geospatial diversity, and we also have touched on that today, but taking full advantage of the wide range of both types of sensors and sensor platforms that we have available to us today and bringing them all together as effectively as we can. John used the example of AIS and radar, uh, two excellent examples, but there are others in terms of different types of geospatial sensors, particularly infrared, hyperspectral, and LIDAR that have uh, much application to the maritime domain that I would expect to see grow pretty dramatically in the future, both as individual collection types of uh, phenomenologies and also uh, bringing them together. Uh, we also need to talk about the full range of hydrographic data to include METOC and oceanographic data, particularly if you happen to be involved in ASW and submarine warfare. Uh, all of those are important in the broad array of data sets that we have beyond things that are just happening on the surface of the ocean. Uh, we expect to see grow in the future. Finally, underscoring the strategic importance of the maritime domain. Along those lines, I would just uh, mention a couple things which uh, most people have already forgotten. And um, let's see, since it's after lunch, we'll have an audience quiz. How's that? Okay. Um, let's see, Merchant Vessel Limburg. Has anybody heard of the Merchant Vessel Limburg? Okay, one of the most... Uh, didn't happen on television. Attacked by Al-Qaeda off the uh, Arabian Peninsula in October of 2002. What did it do to global insurance rates for maritime shipping? Drove them up dramatically. UBL said he thought it was one of his most successful but least heralded attacks as it came. Uh, it was a large VLCC tanker that was attacked by a ship some miles from land where there were no cameras from CNN or anybody else to record it. A very significant event in the uh, terrorism challenges that we've had in the last 10 years, and one 
that most people have already forgotten, including, I guess, most of this audience. Uh, the ship was ultimately towed to repair, and I think it just was renamed. Uh, I think it's on the UK <coughs> registry now about two years ago, but they basically had to rebuild the entire vessel after the attack that uh, took place on the high seas back in October of 2002. Uh, the Mumbai attacks in India in 2008, how did the attackers get there? They came on ships. In fact, they took over a uh, Indian Navy ship and killed most of the crew before they got down there and uh, used that as a point of entry into Mumbai. Another thing which we need to keep in mind. Uh, Sri Lankan Navy operations in 2007. How many large ships did they sink? Three and then a fourth. They did three in one action. Very large action on the high seas, uh, about 300 miles um, south southeast of Sri Lanka, in which they took out some LTTE supply ships that had been making life pretty miserable for them a long time, and uh, destroyed and ultimately sunk three of the ships, and then a separate action a few days later sunk a fourth one. Uh, I don't have to talk to you about the USS Cole attack, which took place in 2000, October of 2000. Um, all the piracy activity that continues to take place in the uh, Gulf of Aden, the Gulf of Oman, the South China Sea, and also in the Straits of Malacca, other places which we don't pay uh, quite as much attention to. And the uh, mortar attack by Al-Qaeda elements in Jordan, on USS Ashland and USS Kearsarge in Aqaba in uh, August of uh, 2005. And I could go on. These are just a few examples I would provide for you. The point I'm making is there are a lot of things happening on the world's oceans that people aren't paying attention to. And I think it is up to all of us to, to remind people occasionally that some very important events are happening on the high seas. And um, you won't see them on network television because there aren't any television cameras out there to record them. So they're not quite as spectacular in terms of the media being able to look after things, but they're very real. The one exception to that, uh, I've come to find that on uh, YouTube, there is some spectacular and gripping image by the attacks by the Sri Lankan Navy that I referred to earlier, and that's all out there in the public domain. Um, so it's up to us, I think, to keep people apprised of the fact that these things are taking place and the importance of the maritime domain. The final walk-off line I'll give you, as I stressed a little bit in a broader context earlier, uh, we're going to have some surprises in the maritime domain. Probably sooner rather than later, certainly sometime in the next five years. And uh, we need to be ready for them. And I think that could cover the range of issues that we've talked about here this afternoon, whether it's proliferation, uh, expanded piracy, uh, but also fundamental naval warfare and having to go force on force, which is a um, kind of competence that certainly uh, the nations that are represented in the panel can't uh, afford to let go too far afield because you never know when you're going to need it. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and the discussion from the panel. Excellent presentation. Thank you, uh, Admiral. Okay, I'm going to hand over straight away to Captain Martin Jones to talk about the Intelligence Collection Strategy and Policy view of life. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm not. <laughs> The Admiral said that 84% of the world is covered by the sea. I guess what I wasn't quite expecting is that he was going to cover 100% of the subject and therefore effectively eat everybody else's sandwiches. Um, I come from this currently as the Geospatial Intelligence Policy with MOD, but that's just my brand new hat that I put on. My previous hats are I am a seafarer. I'm in the Royal Navy and I've spent uh, most of my previous life either being at sea in command or assessing other commanders in their role. In my background, I'm a, a, a METOC in US language, I'm a hydrographer in British language, or in our new language, I'm an HM, uh, hydrography, oceanography, and meteorology. So my time has been as a data gatherer, uh, but also as an analyzer of that data and seeing how that data is, irrele how that data is relevant to, to what we do. One of my concerns for the panel today is, and I don't want to underestimate the importance of the recognized maritime picture of the white uh, shipping, as in merchant shipping, and whether it really is white or whether it is up to nefarious activities or anything like that. And we all know how important counter narcotics is, we know how important counter proliferation is, counter piracy, counter terrorism. And all these things tend to make us focus and concentrate on that which is happening on the surface and how the various intelligences and sensors, especially those that are geospatially connected, can give us the information to not necessarily give us that information superiority, but to enable us to use the very, very limited resources we have for that massive, massive area in which we operate. 
What I'd like us to spend a little bit of the time in the panel discussions is focusing on is actual proper war fighting. Because although the current issues are pretty well dominated by counterinsurgency on the land, we mustn't forget in the maritime domain, we are a war fighting service. And fundamentally, we have got to make sure we are ready should we have to use our maritime power for that which it was originally designed even though it has the, the freedoms and it has the different capabilities to deal with a whole load of complex problems. And the particular area that geospatial intelligence can support and that I would like us as an audience to concentrate on is the underwater domain. Now, clearly, the Admiral didn't let that one go past. He covered it. But I'd just like us to focus a little bit more on that. And there's a whole lot within the underwater domain that is supported by intelligence, either supported by the acoustic intelligence and how that's geospatially connected, Visualization in the products that we have is vitally important because situational awareness in the underwater domain, whether it's for uh, counter uh, mining threats, which supports the land effect and supports all the counter surface things that are going on, or whether it's pure uh, submarine operations and whether those submarine, op submarine operations are there to support indicators and warnings, whether they're to support other collection activities, or whether they're to support traditional uh, shooting capabilities. So my final point is that as much as I do like the fact that we have some fantastic technologies now that give us a massive picture of what's going on compared to what we used to have, and it still has lots of holes in it, and it still needs a massive coordination effort to make it work efficiently, can we just spend a little bit of time thinking about pure warfighting? Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Okay, we're going to move on uh, very rapidly to Lieutenant Commander Susan Longpouncher from the NATO Shipping Centre, and Susan's going to talk about us, or tell us about her day job. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm not going to spend so much time talking about me, but rather what I do, because I think if I spend a moment to talk about what I do and we use the current counter piracy operations as an end user of, uh, of this geospatial information, it'll paint a picture for how it can be applied, I think, in many other places as well. Uh, I am next, okay. Just, I won't go in any depth of these ones, but just to give you an overview of what kinds of things uh, we need to be thinking about when we talk about uh, geospatial information use within counter piracy operations. I need to put it in context for you. Uh, I'm not sure what the, what the level within the audience is in terms of um, the maritime domain and even less perhaps about uh, counter piracy operations. Um, I think each speaker now has done a good lead in for the next one because uh, my previous colleague uh, has mentioned two things. One, uh, the worry about merchant ships being up to nefarious activities and he's speaking very much like a warfighter who thinks of any other ship out there as a potential target. I'm on the opposite side of the coin. Uh, and he also said, you know, let's get back to real war fighting. I see a, a um, gray hull out there, uh, a naval ship out there for their sole purpose of keeping um, freedom of the seas for navigation, for the, the, the pliable uh, economic trades. So fight if you need to, but your main purpose there is to let's keep um, shipping safe. No different than it was um, 300 years ago when uh, the pirates of those days were plundering economic trade. Uh, so I'll bring us back to the other role as opposed to just straight war fighting. Uh, the NATO Shipping Centre, just to put some context again, we are the permanent point of contact with the commercial industry, being that hub between the Navy between and, and industry. And when I say industry, not just ships at sea. Every aspect of the commercial shipping industry, whether it's the ship owners, uh, industry associations, insurers, builders, um, ship registries, national shipping um, authorities from a governance perspective, anything where there is interaction between NATO from a military side and the industry, uh, we are a point of contact. We don't deal with all those things and we, we pass them on, but, but we are basically the hub. That's the first thing we do. The second thing is be engaged in the actual day-to-day -day operations of whatever NATO is involved in in the maritime domain. Right now, the flavor of the month is, is piracy. Uh, we've also still maintained a counterterrorism role in terms of tracking things in the Mediterranean, and we've just wrapped up working with um, uh, the Libya campaign as well. We were tracking ships. So tracking ships transiting any area of operations for which NATO is engaged. Because we are tracking ships and we've made these relationships with industry, we can then advise 
the shipping industry on threats and current operations, deconflicting shipping from where there are military operations if need be. We can also speak on the other side and advise our commanders about shipping industry initiatives, shipping trends, and be engaged from that perspective. So that, that sets the stage of where we are and, uh, and how we speak both languages of both industry and, and naval talk. In terms of uh, why it's important and what our role is, why we're doing what we're doing, it's to avoid this, having victims of piracy. And you look here, uh, the one on the far right, which is the, the iceberg, which has been uh, basically abandoned by its owners, which also means the crew has also been abandoned. Uh, they've been in captivity for 18 months now. Uh, the one on the far left on the bottom there, uh, that's the motor vessel owner as well, uh, abandoned and crews um, spread out. Uh, and then the one on the top left, Pacific Express, uh, not captured by pirates, but they tried to burn out the crew who would uh, safely secure themselves in a citadel. Um, and, and this was the result. The pirates were captured, all of them in in variety of ways, victims of piracy, all increasing the uh, the impact on shipping across the the whole domain of the industry. How do we avoid this? We produce some products, and the main ones I want to bring to your attention. And what I'd like to do is industry, illustrate what it is we need to do, how we do it, and therefore how do we use the geospatial information that we need. The, the two main products that we produce, this is just a snapshot from everything that, from many things that are available on our website. But this one in particular here, it's what we call our PEG map, the Pirate Attack Group. This gets updated as many times a day as we need to based on information that we receive of where the threat is to merchant shipping. So anybody who is regularly online or anybody who has an RSS feed, which then is also updated, can have an immediate um, indication of where the current threat is to merchant ships. And the prime people that receive this, of course, are the masters on board, company security officers, and owners. What it allows us to do is give them uh, a better time awareness and time preparation for taking the, the necessary evasive action. But we need to build these. In order, well, and we need to build these and we need to know where ships are. Uh, for the counter piracy operations that we have right now, ships are required to, to check in and they call in to the Maritime Security Center for the Horn of Africa, which is uh, manned and organized by the European <coughs> Union Naval Forces, which we work very closely with. I'm speaking on NATO's part today, but really the things I'm talking about are encompassing all the players in terms of the coalition navies who are um, one and the same in terms of our objectives here. Uh, UKMTO, the UK Maritime Trade um, Organization, they have an office set up in Dubai, and they, uh, ships also check in with them when they get into the area. Then feed comes in, information comes in to us, and we monitor and track everything, and we relay information back out to everybody. So we have a, a reporting network, and as long as ships adhere to what they're supposed to do and actually check in, that works out fine. Not all of them do, unfortunately. And it is part of, uh, the Admiral mentioned the best management practices, um, and it is part of the requirements of uh, the recommendations for merchant ships to, uh, to check in so that we all have awareness of where of where the ships are. As was mentioned, the recognized maritime picture. We're trying to build this so that we can make effective decision making. The key things we're using here that, I'll, that I'm illustrating, of course, is the AIS data we get. Uh, this format alpha is what I mentioned in terms of checking in. We get sites from any other task force assets that are out there. All comes into us and we can build a comprehensive um, RMP, again, to have uh, situational awareness. The one up here, uh, another kind of um, information systems, it's long range inf identification and tracking. And if anybody is not familiar with it, something that's come out as a result of uh, one of the IMO um, safety of life at sea requirements that ships must forward their information to their flag states uh, and as well as the, the nation of their next port of call. We've made some arrangements with the nations, the flag states, that that information can be passed directly to us. Some is passed directly to us, some is passed directly to MSC HOA based on political decisions and where people, where nations are willing to share national data. 
we, we think certainly within the military about the sensitivities of our classified information. From a commercial sensitivity perspective, there's also concerns about who gets what information about a commercial um, venture as well. But these two, in terms of um, uh, geospatial information, this is what we rely on to contribute to our picture here. What we can do with that then, with all the information coming in, as I mentioned, we're able to put out our warnings to security companies, the company security officers, and directly to the ship. The biggest thing that we've been doing that, that certainly has had the most, um, the most oomph and bang for the buck is finding out that we've just received uh, information that a ship has been attacked, <coughs> a ship has been able to repel that attack, but that pirate is still out there. We've been able to um, see where the attack took place, determine what other ships are in the vicinity of 100 nautical miles, and phone those ships directly. Uh, as we phone them, emails are also sent both to the ship and to company security officers and owners. It's, it's very nice. I was at another presentation last week with a, a Greek ship owner who I wasn't even in the conversation, who was telling, talking about this process to somebody. And he said, I know it works because I got the email. I phoned the master to let him know. And he said, I am on it. They just phoned me as well. So that's probably the biggest thing that we're able to do in terms of preventive. And why is that so important? We have very limited resources out at sea right now in terms of ha hard assets, in terms of ships that are out there and aircraft that are flying. If we're able to use information in the most wise uh, opportunity, you know, the wisest way possible, we can limit the number of hard assets. We can't chase every single ship, uh, every single pirate that's out there. We can't have a ship in every single corner, in this instance, of the Indian Ocean. But if we can use information um, appropriately, then we can uh, better our chances of actually having a um, capturing where they are. And most importantly, what we're doing is uh, seeing, and, seeing and detecting where pirates are and then warning ships off. The challenges that we face, though, uh, is that we still need to maintain the real-time positions. And if we don't have, a, uh, if AIS is turned off or if we have holds, uh, we, we miss out on that. The ships call in, but we don't always have a, a good match of real-time position. Uh, as I mentioned, sharing commercially sensitive information is a challenge. Uh, a lot of the information that comes into us comes through a classified domain, whether it is officially classified or not we then have a challenge in being able to put that, whether it's a photo that we want to share to people. Um, motherships, I won't get too much into this, but a visual picture of a ship that we believe is a potential pirate ship. We want to put that out there for all the other ships out there to, to see. If that picture has been taken by a military asset through a class, even if it's not classified, I can't just automatically put it on, my, on our website and, and share it, so that's a challenge as well. If it's taken by a company security officer or somebody who's on the merchant ship, they share it with us readily and then we can share it with everybody else. The last big challenge for us is having increased automation between the data inputs we have and all the databases as well so that when a call comes in or a piece of information comes in, there's a much faster response because it, uh, anomalies show up or cross-reference as to why something's very important um, characteristics of a ship so we know which ships are the, the um, uh, most vulnerable based on their own characteristics. So there's still, I think, room to uh, have great research into the AIS development to uh, improve the way we can then do business, ultimately, uh, oh, I, ultimately dealing with this problem of pirates at sea. Thank you very much.